Hello everyone. So first of all, if you like this video at all, if you find it interesting or informative, hit that thumbs up down there and feel free to leave a comment. It helps traffic to the channel and traffic to this message. Feel free to share this wherever you want as long as you give me credit and feel free to become a patron on Patreon. And now we'll talk about the Taino um, indigenous peoples that lived on the island of Haiti and in the islands around Haiti. So some of the first islands that Columbus got to, sailed to, uh, were the islands of the Taino. And I'm going to speak specifically about Haiti. So when he got close to the shores, there were a number of uh, Taino indigenous peoples. They looked like Native Americans swimming towards the boats. They didn't, you know, the Spanish didn't quite know what was going on. There wasn't so much of a fight as a misunderstanding. But the Taino swam back and took their canoes back and allowed the Spanish to dock. Dock is kind of a loose term here. They didn't really have docks in the same sense, but they allowed them to, you know, put their ships in anchor and come ashore. And there was a whole reciprocal understanding of the relationship on the Taino natives part. They're like, okay, new people, because this is they've encountered other peoples before, not Spanish, not colonials, not Europeans. But anytime there's new people coming in, even a, even on something like a big wooden ship, which they've never seen before, there is an exchange of presents, a gift for a gift, um, and you know, kind of a welcoming. So uh, the Spanish assumed that they were welcome completely. And after dealing with them for about three days, Columbus, yes, that one that sailed the ocean blue, he decided that they were uncivilized and that they needed civilization and that they could be used to further the aims and desires of the Spanish crown. After that, after just three days, they started to subjugate them. They split the men from the women. Children usually went to the women. And they, uh, anybody who resisted, burned alive, killed, skinned. Things that you would do to an animal if you're a hunter who does those things to an animal. So, in partial subjugation, men and women were split apart and worked worked very hard and they were fed so little that the women's breasts uh, shrank and produced no milk for their babies to have. So all the children, all the babies died. The children were also probably worked to death. Um, over time, as their population was decimated, you know, out of the whole population at this point, maybe 50%, but it would increase vastly later on. So what we often hear is that Native American tribes did not resist. Why didn't they fight back? They did, we just don't learn about it. It is same with the Taino natives. They formed around a war chief who just, you know, he wasn't a chief originally, but he's just like, I we can't, we can't take this anymore. So he formed resistance. It wasn't a complete resistance. There was still the Spanish still had work parties. They still subjugated most of the Taino population, but the resistance was pretty good. Um, they used guerrilla tactics without learning of guerrilla warfare. Obviously, they just realized, hey, maybe we can uh, uh, surprise them, attack them, and uh, in you know in various places where we know the countryside and they don't, and. Uh, they took out a lot of a lot of Spanish. Um, of course, the Spanish sent more. You know, there was already Spanish there that they didn't kill, um, not from lack of wanting to, but you know, their type of guerrilla warfare with spears and bows and arrows. It was very effective, but the Spanish had muskets. They had metal armor. These were things that the native peoples never had to develop in 300,000 years, even on the American continent, in the North American continent, 
they didn't have to develop what weapons of war that were so effective at killing each other because they ultimately didn't feel like they had ownership of the land, but also uh, they, they learned reciprocity with nature. They lived in conjunction with it. The idea of property rights was strange. How can anybody own a piece of land? There were personal property, like, you know, this is my tent, these are my tools, this is my family, personal property. Different from private property. Private property is completely different. Private property is something that, and this is going, you know, this might turn some people off, but this is going back to, you know, Marx's theory, you know, that of capital, that um, private property is something that someone can use to exploit you. Um, so it should be in the public hands. Something like a big farm or a grocery store nowadays, that would turn into the people's hands. As far as your, your tent back then, or your house now, or your toothbrush, your t-shirt, or your books, that would be personal property, not private property. Private property can be used to extort you and, um, and basically extort your labor and your, uh, your ability to basically make a living on your own. But that goes back into colonism in North America, which, you know, I could go into, um, you know, how all those trees are broken and how private property was, um, was just a lie, but we're not going to go into that because I've already gone far off of my original aim. So, um, that resistance, uh, when it was eventually put down, um, they got the uh, war chief. And by the way, a lot of the Native American tribes and even the Taino, they agreed upon things by consensus. There wasn't a leader. They just like talked and agreed upon things. Like that's possible. We just don't really see it in modern government. Um, some level of consensus and even true democracy, we, it's just beyond us at this point. Because everything is run by profit motive, and the politicians are financed by people who have the most money. At any rate, let's continue. So when they isolated this war chief, um, you know, they got him, and they were getting ready to burn him alive. They put him on the pyre, tied his hands around this log, and a bunch of other logs are around it, and and uh, a Catholic priest, kind of the only priests at this time, but maybe Protestantism might have been around. But anyway, they did the same stuff. So a priest came up and said, um, and this is pretty powerful, he said to him, uh, basically, he was going to get burned alive either way. But he said, you can go to heaven if you admit that uh, your Lord and Savior is Jesus Christ. And he says something interesting, and these things are recorded by a couple Spanish priests that actually fought against what was happening to the natives. There's two of them. The oldest one was hunted down and killed. The one beneath him who sent all these trees, all these letters, and went back and forth to the Spanish crown trying to say, we can't do, the, we can't do this to these people. What, this isn't right. And I wish I remember his name. I, I should remember his name, and I should look it up and put it in the video. But if I don't, I hope I give you enough information to find him. But he said, you know, we can't keep doing this. That wasn't the priest there when this... Uh, the leader of the Taino people were, you know, was going to be burned. What this leader said, leader by consensus, he asked, you know, while he, as he's tied to the pyre, he asked, um, in response to the priest's question, you know, do you want to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Then you get to go to heaven. He said, um, where do, where have my people gone? before you came, the priest said to hell. And, he, and then he asked, where do Christians go after they die? The priest said to heaven. And this man said, I'd rather go to hell. And then he was born, burned alive at the stake. There's something that we need to understand about the idea of hell. The vast majority of the time that it has been used, it has been used 
because people have hellish consciousness. And the people who are accusing others of the possibility or the actuality of them going to hell, saying that somebody's going to go to hell, they have a hellish consciousness. They're basically demons. And they think that they are devout Christians. If you have a hellish consciousness thinking that anybody who doesn't agree with you or your religion is going to hell, you're basically the traditional idea of a demon. Now we can argue about, you know, what is a demon, what is a daemon, but the traditional Christian idea of a demon is ironically somebody who thinks that they are the most devout because they think everybody else is going to hell or these Taino peoples are going to hell. That is a hellish mindset. They have placed themselves into a hellish consciousness before they even get there. And, you know, I'm not going to go into, you know, karma and Hinduism and how the hellish realms actually work. Uh, but I guarantee you these people got bad karma <laughs> for doing these things to the Taino people. Or thinking that they're going to hell just because they don't follow the same savior. It's almost like, you know, oh, uh, my savior's the best. You have to follow him. But I got my own saviors. No, no, but you don't understand. Like, if my Savior doesn't save you, then his dad's going to put you in hell. It doesn't make any sense. It's engineered. It doesn't make any sense. It never has. So, what am I getting at? Why did I tell you this story, and why has it been so disturbing? So, history is disturbing, but I'm getting to a point. Papa Legba. I think of it as a voodoo. Voodoo, Vodun, I, I don't use the term Vodun, but Vodou or Voodoo, Papa Legba. There's something interesting about the symbol that we use for Papa Legba. It's called a Veve. Where did Veves come from? Veves are used in multiple Voodoo, Vodou, or many, even Santeria. There's a lot of places that Veves are used. They historically track back to, to the Taino people. People who, on the beaches of what we now think of as Haiti, would do rituals. But first, they would carve the symbols with sticks into the sands of the beaches of their spirits. And that would be a ritualistic representation of the spirits. Kind of like an idol, but also a symbol that is a gateway into seeing the practitioners of the ritual and a way for them to communicate with their spirits and gods. I don't know enough about what the Taino believe to say spirits or gods, or perhaps it's irrelevant completely. Perhaps that's just something that we'd like to label um, because we get these labels later on, but it was a way to communicate to other realms, to spirits that existed in higher levels of consciousness here or in other dimensions. So when... When most of the Taino were dead, worked to death, they brought in African slaves. Yes, they got people from Africa, brought them over to work. And something interesting started to happen. So there's some Taino left, and there was still some in the hills. And some Africans escaped to the hills. And then there were some Taino still among the, um, the slave population that the Spanish had. And eventually it became French way later on. Uh, the the colon colonial... Um, oppressors, but um, they started to mix cultures, started to mix traditions. And Christianity kind of started to creep in because there's a whole bunch of Christian symbols around, Christian priests, and a lot of time they were forced to go to church or mass. Um, I don't know if they ever went to mass, but they were definitely made to claim themselves to be Christian, both the Africans and the remaining Taino. So this strange amalgamation of Christianity, a little bit of Jewish symbolism as well somehow, and um, the ancient Taino symbols, for, and then also African spirituality. That formed, this is not the best symbol for Papa Ligba, but this is the basic one. The full symbol and I've been working with this for nine years, and this is what they usually look like after you've been offering a lot of things onto them for nine years. Looks like this. That is the shape of, you know, the full symbol. It's a veve. Now, 
usually you offer things on paydays because it is it's the spirit it's the god it's the 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 being that you're working with so you're offering it to the veve upon the sheet regardless these veves are still used the taino people's culture has not been lost it has not been subjugated and despite the spanish colonizers insistence upon their idea of the cosmological nature of the universe and who god is what god is and the one union monotheistic idea of god despite all of that their traditions have not died their symbols are still ones used throughout the world in vodou and voodoo and i like to think though i cannot confirm that when we look upon these babies, when we look into the dimensions of when those original Christian colonizers said you're going to hell, perhaps it might have been their idea of hell. Because most native peoples, and I imagine the Tainos as well, idea of the ancestral realm was ancestors of plants, animals. Beings of nature that are huge and vast and gigantic and shining with light, almost like a jungle, but with huge trees, huge animals, and everything is intelligent. And then ancestors that are various sizes, all intelligent. And in these realms, there's not this need to consume. This it's not it's not a material realm. It's a spiritual realm. There's there's a there's a, a oneness. A talking with the trees, a, a talking with the plants, talking with the animals, because everything can communicate better. It's like an astral realm. Ancestors, ancient knowledge can communicate with their descendants. Everything is in a whole other level of reciprocity that we can't even imagine here on Earth, even though we can still have a reciprocity of nature here. To a Christian mind at that time, especially these people that tortured these Taino peoples to death, that would be hell. They imagine heaven as big buildings, as conference rooms, as a king on a pedestal. I believe that the Tano people, then and even now, go to something that's far more and less, less governmental and far more oneness, sharing existence, nature, love, oneness. So when we look at the Veves, think of those dimensions that those Christians were too ignorant to comprehend or even imagine existed. So much so that they carved the people who did up and, in a way, carved their own spirits up. Long live the First Nations.